George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain candidate, 12,003. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... Do I respect the Prime Minister? I despise the Prime Minister. Just suck it up. I won the election. Sing hallelujah, she's alive, but alas, unwell. Princess Kate finally is allowed to speak and address her nation. And murder most foul, mass murder most foul, as the number of fatalities in the shootout in Moscow in the Crocus Theatre reaches almost 200 people, plus all the wounded the mutilated and the maimed will be deep diving into this ghastly terrorist crime. Not that you've heard it described as such in either the UK or the US media. Terrorism's okay, you see, as long as it's directed against the right kind of innocent civilian. Fasten your seatbelt. This is going to be a particularly bumpy night as Betty Davis once said, because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, we're not really royalists here at the mother of all talk shows. Indeed, some of us are outright Republicans, including me. We're not like those other stick of Valentines, the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democratic Party, whose spokespeople, all of whom, have attacked me and the mother of all talk shows in the last 24 hours. And these other stick of Valentines in the Daily Express, is that still coming out? And the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph, all these royalist, fawning sycophants are outraged, they say, at the interviews that we here on the Mother of All Talk Shows have done in the last couple of weeks, expressing our concern about the whereabouts and the state of health of the Princess of Wales. Now, we're not royalists, but we kind of like our Princess Kate. And we were worried about her. And we had every right to worry about her, as it turns out. She had not been seen in public since Christmas Day. And spring is here. She had been the subject of at least two, maybe three, fake photoshopped images to try to show us that she was alive and well. Well, we now know that she is alive. We now know that she is not well. And so on behalf of all here, Republican or Royalist, 
at the mother of all talk shows, let me express this. We have the deepest sympathy for Princess Kate, the Princess of Wales, particularly her, because we like her in the royal family. We consider her a gracious and beautiful lady. We were concerned about her then, we're concerned about her now. We pray to God that she recovers fully and swiftly from the illness that she is now suffering, which appears to have been revealed by abdominal surgery a month or two ago. We wish that the royal family had more honesty and candor and, well, dependability in their communications. It's they, not us, who have been struck off the Associated Press and Reuters and other reputable agencies. And it's they, not us, who will never be trusted again by those agencies because they don't like being fed a dodgy bill of goods. And that's what these photographs were, a dodgy bill of goods. Now that we know that this young mother, this gracious and beautiful lady, is suffering from cancer, we all pray and wish her well. We wish for her full and speedy recovery. But we won't be lectured to by sycophants with checkbooks who purchase things. You see, we had every right to be concerned about Princess Kate because some of us are old enough to remember her mother-in-law. We know what can happen. We've watched The Crown on Netflix. We know what can happen to individuals of the royal blood, never mind individuals who marry in to the House of Windsor. We know what happened to Lady Diana. We're determined that it shouldn't be allowed to happen to Princess Kate. Now, murder most foul is what took place in Moscow this week in a shopping mall in the Crocus Theatre in Moscow at the hands of a terrorist group, all four of whom, of the shooters, have now been apprehended and 11 people are now under arrest in connection with the cowardly murder of currently more than 180 people, innocent people, unarmed people, civilian people, during Ramadan, when it is actually forbidden to make an aggressive attack. Muslims are allowed during Ramadan only to defend themselves from attack. They are forbidden to mount an aggressive, offensive attack, even against an armed adversary. So that was my first whiff of how badly the swiftly distributed American, UK, Western lie that this heinous terrorist mass murder had been carried out in the name of Islam. We never believed it. Some of you may have been fooled, but you'd have to be up early in the morning to fool the likes of me. You see, I've been through many a false flag operation in the course of my lifetime. I saw the United States drawn into the Vietnam War, which killed millions of people on a false flag operation. I've seen lots of false flag operations that were called conspiracy theories, even though now everybody accepts that they were true. I saw with my eyes the assassination of the late and great president, John F. Kennedy. It was a lone gunman at first, a lone, unhinged, deranged gunman who might even have ties to Cuba, might even have ties to Moscow, there were no others involved. There was no conspiracy, they said. Now you won't find anybody anywhere, anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world, who any longer believes that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, killed President Kennedy. 
on Elm Street in that nightmare in November of 1963. I saw with my own eyes Senator Robert F. Kennedy being murdered on his way to being anointed as the Democratic Party's presidential candidate in California in 1968. I saw with my eyes the murder of the Reverend Martin Luther King. I saw with my own eyes the murder of the great Malcolm X. I saw all these things. I heard all the official narratives and all of them turned out to be a pack of lies. So I don't automatically accept anything, especially when it comes out within minutes of an act of mass murder from the country that hasn't yet solved the assassination of their own president in broad daylight as long ago as 1963. So when the US and the UK and others swiftly tried to reassure me that it was only ISIS that carried out this mass murder in Moscow, I knew automatically that they were lying. And now I am working back. And here's what I'm finding. I'm finding, first of all, that no one, no one has explained the unannounced visit of President Barack Obama to meet British political and security officials in 10 Downing Street three days before this terrorist crime was carried out. Working further back, I discover that Victoria Newland, that harbinger of death, that angel of death, who, if she comes anywhere near you, be sure a civil war is coming in your country. I saw her with my own eyes, promise the Russians some nasty surprises in the next few weeks and months. I'm working further back, and I discover that the White House spokesman, John Kirby, announced that American citizens had been warned to stay away from crowded places, including shopping malls and theaters in the great city of Moscow, the greatest city in Europe, the capital of the largest country on the earth. And I was never that great at mathematics, but I know that one and one makes two. I know that one and two makes three. I know that one and three makes four. And so I have four pieces of evidence in my mind that leads me to believe that the United States, that the NATO allies and their proxy servant, the state of Ukraine, the remaining state of Ukraine, were in fact responsible for this mass murder. And we will be talking in the course of this show uh, to the great Scott Ritter, who I think has reached a somewhat similar conclusion, though knowing him will have dived deeper than I have had the time to dive. Because I'm involved in all kinds of politics, not just international. Now that I'm a member of parliament again, I have domestic, constituency, national, as well as international responsibilities. And I'm doing my best to live up to those responsibilities on all fronts. I've spoken in Parliament three times in the last 10 days. That's more times than most MPs speak in an entire year. Three speeches in 10 days. I hope you've seen them. If you haven't, look them up, because they reflect this new multidimensional set of responsibilities that I have. My maiden speech in Parliament, there it is on the screen, was overwhelmingly about Rochdale, 
and about Britain and its parlous economic situation under the uni party, ironclad consensus of Conservative and Labour, that tightly clenched set of buttocks, the left and right of which are impossible to discern from the other. In my second speech, I addressed, amongst other things, my overwhelming belief that we discussed last Wednesday here on the mother of all talk shows, that this peer built of the skulls and the bones and the ruins of the houses of the owners of the skulls and the bones being built in Gaza is intended not for the purpose of bringing in aid to a starving, sickening, desperately thirsty, freezing cold population, but is instead intended to facilitate the mass deportation of those people who are starving, sickening, and dying of thirst. I suppose the Daily Express would call that a conspiracy theory. But like many conspiracy theories, it is founded in fact. It is founded in evidence. It is founded in the conduct of that most heinous of occupation armies, the army that calls itself the Israel Defense Force, who have been breaking all new norms in the bestial, fascistic oppression of the people who lie at their feet, at their mercy, now extended even to mass rape of Palestinian women detainees. You don't have to take my word for that, incidentally. Some of you, I know, will not. I refer you to the Jerusalem Post. I refer you to the United States official in the Jerusalem Post making that allegation. People in the Al Shifa hospital report that groups of Palestinian men, groups of between 8 and 12 men at a time, were being led away by Israeli soldiers, followed by a ferocious burst of gunfire and then silence as the bodies were taken away. I'm talking about mass executions in a hospital. Now, do you remember, are you old enough to remember, approximately 150 days ago, when Israel denied and called a blood libel, the idea that they would bomb a hospital. You remember it? You remember they said it was a misfiring Hamas rocket. You remember they said it was an anti-Semitic lie that they would attack a hospital. Do you know that 150 days later, there is not a single hospital in all of Gaza that they have not attacked? Do you know there's scarcely one brick standing upon another in the hospitals of the Gaza Strip that have not been attacked openly, without any denial, on camera? Not just the buildings, but the interiors, but the patients, the staff, the doctors, however senior, however eminent, who've been murdered inside these hospitals. You see the problem with normalizing war crimes? You see the problem with normalizing genocide? The main problem is that once you've accepted it once, you will incrementally accept it happening over and over again and in ever more crazed, inhuman examples of this kind of mass murder, torture, 
and rape, which is taking place at the hands of one of Britain and America's closest allies, a country, Israel, which is armed by us, funded by us, propagandized for by us, diplomatically protected by us. And of course, the mass murders in the hospital are only a part of the unfolding genocidal crimes that you can see behind me on your screen right now. And it is going on and on and on for all the faff about ceasefires, humanitarian pauses, prisoner exchanges, during all of that guff, children and their mothers and their fathers, sisters, brothers, uncles, aunts, grandparents are still daily being massacred. And the grim reaper of famine and disease cuts a swathe through those who somehow evade, escape the scything hot lead from shot and shell. You better stay tuned. This is going to be one hell of a show. It's the mother of all talk shows. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily posting discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza, uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So it was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Record starting audience tonight, maybe a record number of phone calls, although the record standing as it is at many hundreds, I forget how many hundreds, no doubt my director will tell me, is maybe going to be beaten tonight. Here is the number to call if you want to call the show. If you're in the US or Canada, it's toll free, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, again, free of charge, it's 0808196552. And the worldwide number is 442039662625. So the record is 877 calls in one show. Will we meet it tonight? Uh, the poor production team has only just recovered from that 877 calls in one show. So they'll be hoping it's not quite as busy. But it's a very big show tonight with very big guests and very big subjects. The poll is looking like it might be a record poll also. Because 39,207 people have already voted in it. And I'm only announcing it now. Is the U.S. guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? Yes or no? You can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me 
forward slash George Galloway, or on my X, my Twitter, look for the blue tick, George Galloway MP, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. If you're watching on the YouTube stream, or on Facebook, or on any platform that allows you to do so, please share, please share with your colleagues, your friends, your followers, that you are watching this show now, and so should they. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do it. Give a thumbs up for the show and press the bell so that you know when I am broadcasting. Now, one man who knows a thing or two about the power of propaganda, but who also knows how to stand up to propaganda, how to fight it, and how to win against it, is Professor David Miller. I say professor, although he is a professor, He's not currently working as a professor because he was unfairly dismissed from that on a bogus set of accusations that I'm sure he's itching to tell you about. Now, he is the producer of Palestine Declassified. He is an author and quite the political commentator. Professor Miller, you'll always be Professor Miller to me. Uh, For those few in the audience who don't know what happened to you and what happened next, kindly summarize what happened. I will do, but first, George, uh, I would to say congratulations for being uh, elected to Parliament once again, uh, a great achievement. Um, so Thank what you. Happened to me, Thank you very what, much, Professor. What happened to me was that I was sacked on October the 1st, 2021, um, after a three-year campaign by Zionists against me who had complained about my research, my evidence-based research on the Zionist movement, and in particular uh, on the research which I had done which showed that the Zionist movement is a key player behind the spread of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim prejudice uh, in the UK and in other places too. Uh, that campaign was uh, run by student groups. It was run by academics in my own university. It was run by academics around the world. More than 100 members of the Houses of Commons and Lords signed a letter demanding for me to be sacked. There were debates in Parliament calling for me to, to be to be gone, and I was gone. And the university sacked me uh, uh, as a result of that campaign. Uh, I appealed, they denied my appeal, and then I took them to court, to the Industrial Tribunal, to the Employment Tribunal. And that sat from the 16th of October last year, just nine days after the launch of what's called Al-Aqsa Flood, when uh, the Palestinian resistance broke out of Gaza. And so in that kind of context, I was grilled uh, and cross-examined for two days, two and a half days in court, and the university's witnesses likewise were grilled and cross-examined. The university was found to have wrongly dismissed me, to have not properly investigated the charges against me and to have not properly evaluated the investigation which they did. Uh, But they were also found to have uh, sacked me, uh, not just because uh, um, they they had just just, uh, dismissed me wrongfully, they had also sacked me uh, on the basis of my anti-Zionist views. They had claimed that the reason they'd sacked me was because I'd said things about students which were inappropriate. And what I said was that I'd been attacked and complained about by, by Zionist student groups, those are the words I used, and uh, the court determined that that wasn't the case, they hadn't sacked me for that, that reason, they had sacked me specifically because I had anti-Zionist views, and if I hadn't had those, those anti-Zionist views and I'd done everything else that I did, they wouldn't have sacked me. So this was a tremendous breakthrough because it establishes in law for the first time that anti-Zionist views are protected under the Equality Act 2010, uh, but also <clears throat> Therefore, that uh, anti-Zionist views are not racist, that there is a distinction to be drawn between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, a distinction which the government of Israel has tried to abolish and obliterate for the last half century. So that, that's what happened to me. I came out of that uh, entirely um, uh, justified and uh, my name cleared, uh, and we now await to see uh, how um, much money the university is going to be forced to give me as a result. Now, it's very odd, isn't it, as you describe it? Uh, I mean, in a sense, 
how could uh, being opposed to Israel and being opposed to the ideology, the political ideology of Zionism, make you ipso facto guilty of anti-Semitism? If you think about it, it's absurd. If, if, uh, if I hated Saudi Arabia, would I be guilty of hating Muslims? If I hated the Soviet Union and communism, would I be guilty of hating Russians, hating the people of the Soviet Union? Ditto Nazism, if you were an anti-Nazi, would you have been actually hating Germans or loving Germans, wishing to see them liberated from uh, the hateful political ideology? Ideologies are man-made. Religions, if you believe in them, as I do, are uh, made by God. Uh, maybe God uh, can be criticized. Men definitely can be criticized. It's very odd that an exception ought to have ever been considered right in the case of Zionism, isn't it? Well... It is odd, um, but it's an exception which the Israelis have spent an inordinate amount of time and resources and money on uh, on uh, putting into place. They've been doing this since uh, at least 1972 when the Foreign Minister Abba Iban said that uh, anti-Zionism was the, quote, new anti-Semitism. And that, that is the phrase which they have used ever since then. And they have tried to bludgeon and intimidate and bully people into accepting their definition. And it's cu currently codified uh, in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, where that, the distinction between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is deliberately broken down. Uh, and it's a, they've then attempted to impose that uh, everywhere that they can. And you'll, of course, recall, famously, they were able to impose it upon the Labour Party, uh, and many other places in the UK, including on my university, indeed my university, uh, itself offered to the complainant, to the head of the Zionist student group, that she should pause her complaint while the university decided whether it would change its rules and introduce the IHRA, which it duly did, and then it duly uh, reinvestigated me and found in any case um, that I was uh, not guilty of any anti-Semitism at all. So what's going to happen next? Uh, they're not going to offer you your job back. Um, I'm not even sure you'd want it. Uh, they're going to have to compensate you handsomely, and it's cost the university a pretty penny all round already, I uh, hazard a guess. Will it, uh, will it be um, satisfying to you uh, to simply walk away with enough money to fund your research and your... Uh, academic work elsewhere, uh, or uh, are you more interested in the fact that all academics, all employees, all candidates, perhaps, for political parties, are now effectively protected by the legal battle that you won? Well, the purpose of doing this, of course, was to clear my name. I'd been accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, the university had employed a QC twice to investigate everything that I'd ever said, practically, back to 2013. A QC had determined that there was nothing I'd ever said which was anti-Semitic. Um, but nevertheless, I, the, 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 the cloud of anti-Semitism has followed me around because the Zionists never cease to accuse me of such things, as, a, as I'm sure you're aware of your, yourself when you're accused of similar things. Uh, so the, it was yes, it was about clear, clearing my name, but it was mainly the main purpose of taking this case was to establish that anti-Zionist views are and sh should be protected under the law. And this uh, now, now becomes available to uh, people, anyone in employment across the UK, uh, to protect them from being sacked for the same reason. But it does more than that; it drives uh, a coach and horses through the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition, and it will become increasingly difficult for the Israelis to impose their views on that uh, all across the world as a result of this victory. So I, the, the whole point, point of this was to was to win a, a strategic victory against Zionism, and we have done that, I think, handsomely. The, the question is, well, what happens next? Zionism is, as you know, and as, as one can see in the daily pictures 
challenges that we see from Gaza in a, in a crisis. Ga uh, Zionism is uh, on the verge, I would say, of a collapse. Uh, and uh, the, the whole question we have to face now is what happens when the, the, when Zionism collapses? How do we move towards de-Zionizing? Yes, Palestine, but also the rest of the world. I mean, the, the Zionists have a huge operation in the UK, in the US, in Germany, in France, and many other countries. Uh, and that their brand of racism will not go away quietly. It will have to be uh, piece by piece dismantled so that the Zionist movement itself uh, is taken to pieces and that uh, Jewish communal organizations, for example, can be de-Zionized and put back to their proper purpose, which is to represent ordinary Jews and not to be vectors of racist Zionist ideology. Although... Uh... Jewish organizations are entitled to have any political posture, stripe that they like, but the rest of us are entitled to judge them for the political posture and stripe that they've liked, don't we? That's right. I mean, uh, the the pro problem is, of course, that um, Jewish common organizations, which do not represent the, the wealth of views am amongst ordinary Jews, are simply um, denying them having the, the right to have places of worship, places to go for education, uh, places of political representation, uh, uh, student groups. So it's very difficult for Jews who are non-Zionist or anti-Zionist to find anywhere to represent them because ma many, almost all of the communal organizations are Zionists. So we need to move towards a position where it's recognized that Zionism is racism. Uh, and that as a result, we are opposed to, to Zionism, just like we are to uh, anti-Muslim racism or anti-Black racism. It's a, a similar kind of, a, of an idea. The University of Bristol itself has on its website a commitment that uh, we should be in favor of what, what they call eradicating racism. And I, I very much support that view, and uh, it's a view which I think should be applied to uh, Zionism as well. Professor David Miller, thanks for coming back on the mother of all talk shows. Good to see you again in victory. Is the US guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? Yes or no, over 40,000 people have now voted and the show's only 36 minutes old. You've got well over an hour still to vote. Let's make this an absolutely record-breaking evening. Let's take a quick break and then it's some messages, some calls and more great guests. It's the mother of all talk shows. I defy anyone to contradict the point that I just made that every person alive today was born of woman. So why would we say that the people in the labor wards, in the maternity units, are people who are giving birth? Why can't we say women? Why can't we say mothers? Why can't we say women who are breastfeeding, mothers who are breastfeeding. Why do we need to say people who are chest feeding? All of these words, and indeed all of the trend that you say you dissociate yourself from, of transgenderism, transmania, I call it, are all taking rights away from women. <laughs> You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you'll of course already know that the podcast is breaking all records too. So please don't miss it. Make sure you download it each week, especially if you have missed parts of the show. You can download it by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. You can't handle the truth, says. We lie, we cheat, we steal, we stole. We have the entire training courses. It reminds you of the glory of the American experiment, unquote. That quote is from Mike Pompeo, the ex-CIA director in 2019 at Texas A&M University. Well, there you go. Zeppelin says, I'm walking through a forest, walking my dog, and George has already got me all riled up to fight the good fight 
what a man educate, agitate, organize. That is my job. Thank you, Zeppelin. Ricky Russo says, I hereby declare George Galloway a man of the people with a working conscience and, conscience and imagination that scares the bejesus out of those petty psychophants. Thank you, Ricky, for that. Let's go uh, to England. Hakim in Hertfordshire, but on the events in Moscow. Hakim, welcome to the show. Hello, George. How are you? Hi. By the grace of God, good. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, George, uh, congratulations for you coming back to the Parliament. This is the sec second time I spoke to you. The first time was like more than 10 years ago in the, the talk sport show. Um, I just wanted okay. to uh, fo uh, focus on that video that was saying, oh, ISIS published a video and all that, and, and they spoke in Arabic and all that. First, they, mm -hmm. they never spoke in Arabic. They, they used Islamic words like mashallah and Allahu Akbar, which everyone knows. Exactly. Right? And exactly. I listened to the, to the action. I promise you, it's an East European action. He's not, he's not Arabic speaking. I am Arabic speaking. I speak Arabic very well. And I understand the accents because I am familiar with foreigners when they speak Arabic. I can, I can see which accent is which from which country. I promise you, they're not Ar mm. Arabs. The, 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 those ISIS. And how come ISIS never mention Palestine? They never attack Israeli targets and all that. I mean, is Ramadan? At least I could have said, you know. This is for Gaza, like you, you said when you won the election in Rojdal, or any, anything, do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, Hakim, and so does Scott Ritter. He'll be firing on all cylinders on that in the second, pardon me, in the second hour of the show. Hakim, thanks for the call. Let's go from England to India, where Mark is on the line, reacting to Professor Miller. Go ahead, Mark. George, let me just say it's an absolute honor to speak with you personally. Um, Thank you so much, I sir. became a fan of you. You're welcome. Uh, I became a fan of you when you first took down the U.S. corrupt Senate back in <clears throat> during the Iraq war. I mean, that made me a big-time fan. Now, I wanted to touch base on... That what was a Professor good day, yeah. 2005, about. almost 20 years now. Absolutely. That was a fantastic day. And you opened the world's eyes when you talked about a lot of things based in Iraq and the world basically woke up. You've been waking everybody up. I just want to say with, with regard to what Professor Miller was talking about, uh, his, you know, they attacked him. Now, I, I want to touch base on something that was like an expose done by Al Jazeera based on APAC. Now, I understand that APAC is a very well entrenched very long tentacles all in the Western world. Nobody's talking about these guys. They've got branches upon branches. They are so well funded, basically taking U.S. aid and putting it into this because there's no other obvious reasons. There's, it's not like, I mean, the U.S. is sending them weapons and stuff like that. So this money's got to be put into APAC, which is then used to lobby all the senators, the congressmen in your country, in the United States, in Germany, all across the Western world. Why is it that the governments of the world do not stand up against this plague? This plague needs to end. These guys are the plague of humanity. And I would be absolutely, you know, thankful to you if you could just go ahead and put some light on these guys because nobody talks about them. They just under the carpet, under the rug, but they've got their roots so well entrenched, nobody can go ahead and do anything about it. I'm trying to understand if any government or, you know, a court could probably prosecute these guys because they are doing such bad stuff across the globe and nobody has anything to say about them. Why is that? Well, uh, of course, uh, those of us uh, on the receiving end of their, uh, their lash... Uh, have plenty to say about it, but you're right. Uh, the Al Jazeera documentary was devastating, but it was never shown, and it's only available uh, for those and such as those online. It was never shown by Al Jazeera. In fact, even their investigation in Britain uh, was never shown on Al Jazeera. I think I may have that latter one 
wrong, but the American one, the revelations about APAC, definitely were not shown on Al Jazeera. Uh, but luckily, some copies managed to make it to the outside world, and I commend it to the House. Uh, Stephen is in Glasgow on NATO. Go ahead, Stephen. How are you going on, George? It's a long time since I locked horns with you. You used to call me a dangerous one. Okay. And you, and you also called my wee friend over there, Nybrox. He was a Thatcher and I hate me, Paul. But we have both came to the conclusion. <laughs> after the yes, you can laugh, George. You were a, a, a leading person in Hillhead at one point, and I wish you would come back to that hums a useless right out of here because the SNP and this whole lot are just doing my head in. Never mind going to Rochdale. You should have came to Glasgow, George. You've got my vote and me Paul's vote anyway. But besides, beside the point. But Thank I'm, you. I'm Thank really you. flabbergasted and I find it incredulous. In the 21st century, we're fighting wars all around the world. Palestine, Gaza, mm. doesn't matter where it is, Ukraine, Russia, Syria, and Yemen. I'm really disgusted even what happened today in Russia. And then there's a blaming game, what happened to these poor children and women and adults, a whole lot of it. Mm. Was it the Americans? Mm. Was it mm. conspiracy theories? A we back in terrorism as Britain as a whole? But I would, what I would like to, to say is, unfortunately, is to end all wars and all troubles all around the world. I think we should take a leaf out of what the Americans did after Pearl Harbor with the Japanese and Hiroshima and all that. They were just bombarding the Sydney Yanks for further enough for this. Why is the point? What's the point of us having weapons of mass destruction and waving a big stick? Diplomacy is no working here, George. UNICEF and all these peaceful campaigns and you send all these world leaders all around the world. It's no working. Go way back to Napoleon's day. Go way back in time. I think it's time for, for now. If you've got these weapons of mass destruction, we've had enough of these. And we shall leave out the Americans' book and just nuke them. That's my personal opinion. End it. No, I'm... Uh, uh, well, thank you, Stephen, for everything except the last line. Uh, we're against uh, anybody nuking anybody because we know that as soon as somebody nukes somebody, that somebody will nuke them back. And uh, before you know it, before you could say uh, Jack Robinson, the entire world will be in nuclear ash and there'll be no humanity and nothing left alive on this planet ever again. So we can't go along with that. But Stephen, thanks uh, for the call. The Ghislaine conspiracy theory, 40,000 votes, Lordy, more than various congressional races. Counts in America, there isn't it. Well, it's 40, nearly 41,000 now. Bren 10 says, I will listen to a George Galloway monologue to psych myself up before the next time I get in the ring. A lot of boxers do, uh, let me tell you. Uh, Matt is in the United States, in Portland, but on Moscow. It's the World Global University of the Airwaves, this. Matt, welcome to the show. Well, well, thank you, George. I agree with you. This is obviously Ukraine doing another terrorist attack. Because you look at, they assassinated Dar 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 Daria Drugina. They went in to, and blew up the cafe in, in St. Petersburg. They did this. Immediately, America goes, no, it was ISIS. ISIS, yeah, they're in Afghanistan, ISIS-K, and they're attacking China, China. They're attacking Chinese contractors. They are not. If they did this, you would have, they would have gone out before they, before they were, they wouldn't have been caught. And some people thought it was Israel because of the fact they were created by the U.S. along with ISIS. No, Mossad would have been in and out. They never would have caught them. They would have only seen the aftermath. This was obviously Ukraine because they were emboldened by the previous attacks that Russia didn't really do anything. So they said, and America said, go ahead. And they, they did it. Now they're, they're realizing how bad it's gotten, how bad this terrorist attack was. And now they're signing going, oh, God, we better hope they don't figure out it was us behind it. And Russia is not dumb. They're smart. Putin came out and just said these people were heading them off, heading to Ukraine, and that, and they were wearing Ukrainian military outfits. The ones that got caught before, they were actually being interrogated. You could see they were wearing Ukrainian military outfits. Plus, these guys are clowns. They're not very professional. One of them was struggling to get the clip in the in the in his rifle um, when they were walking through before they started shooting up the place, and. Like I said, ISIS is way more professional about this when they do these things. These were unprofessional 
you know, paid by the U.S. to do this terrorist act. They didn't. I don't think the U.S. expected this to go as big and expected as many people to get uh, harmed in this. They were. They planned this out. That's why they told Americans, don't go to large venues, don't go to concert halls. They don't. I don't think they expected there were going to be this many people at this concert hall on that night on Friday when they did the terrorist attack. And so now they're they're going, oh God, what do we do? And then all the con, you know the usual Western, you know, fake condolences. Oh, we're so sorry for the for this a terrorist attack and everything. They don't care. They're all thinking this is hilarious. We we got Russia. We got one over on Putin. Trying to say Putin was warned. Russia was never warned. They didn't tell. Him. Now they're trying to say we warned Russia. If they did, Russia would have caught these people. They would never let this happen. They were they had no knowledge. They would have never allowed this concert to go on. They're not that dumb. They're smart. And they're, they're just going to take their time to investigate this. And, you know, everything goes on in Ukraine. Anything goes – they they know that's a war. Taken to Russia means they've expanded this. They're going to – they will know who it is. These guys will tell them who it is, who paid them. Of course, they're going to die at first. They're going to get the answer. They're going to have the – you know, they're going to trace everything, where this van came from. They're going to put it together, and then they'll t- Putin will tell the world. Yeah, uh, they'll Shinji. follow the money, uh, Matt. And there was uh, there was a lot of money involved, and they'll follow the weapons. There were a lot of weapons uh, involved. I don't think you have to be Einstein to work out who did this, but the closest thing to Einstein, military, political Einstein, is Scott Ritter. We'll be speaking to him uh, very shortly uh, uh, about that. Thanks for a great call, Matt. In Portland, Oregon, USA, Lost Adult says, When I hear the word Jew, I think of Katie Halper, Aaron Maté, and Max Blumenthal, the greatest people in the world, God's truly chosen people, because they love us all. And on the line from Los Angeles is Joy on Zionism. Go ahead, Joy. Hello. Uh, I just started following your work over there in the UK, and I'm really, and also coinciding with the October 7th attack and the Oxford flood. I just wanted to ask, how did you learn as, you know, someone also entrenched in kind of, you know, we were talking earlier about the current media environment, about uh, what Zionism is and how um, accepted it is in the United States and in the UK. What was your personal journey in understanding that the narrative might not be complete or honestly just completely false about how it's been framed for us? Well, I never, I never considered the, I never considered the narrative to be anything other than false, uh, because I was brought up as a socialist, as an internationalist, as an anti-imperialist. I always knew uh, who we were with in every conflict every struggle around the world and so I located from my childhood uh, the struggle of the Palestinian people uh, to be free and against uh, Western uh, uh, imposed uh, European colonial settler status uh, I located that struggle on in my firmament uh, on my side we were with the Vietnamese people therefore we were with the Palestinian people. And if you trace it back, as I've said before, my mother once told a journalist that she knew I was not like ordinary boys because I always supported the Red Indians against the cowboys and the cavalry as a child in the uh, watching the westerns uh, on the television. So, Joey, I always knew that Zionism uh, was racism that Zionism was a project built on the bones and the skulls of the Palestinian people whom it uh, displaced and dispersed. I always knew that, so there was no moment of epiphany uh, for me. But I welcome such moments of epiphany wherever, in whomsoever, and at whatever stage of their life that epiphany occurs better that uh, there's more rejoicing in heaven at the sinner that doth repent than of the 99 non-sinners who hath no need of repentance. Anthony Wedgwood says, you know things are bad here when Owen Jones has finally left the Labour Party and is advocating for the Greens 
or independence. I'm going to leave that, Anthony, because not many people know who Owen Jones is, even in this country, never mind the rest of the world. Peter Waugh from Kingston, Jamaica, says thanks for keeping us informed. How about that? Peter Waugh in Kingston, Jamaica. Let's go to Shadi in Nottingham in England on Palestine. Go ahead, Shadi. Hi, George. Our press would like to congratulate you on your win and you becoming a popular you, figure in the Middle East, not because you're standing with Palestine, but because you're standing with what is right. And I find it like mind-boggling how difficult it is nowadays to see what's right from wrong. Like, I don't get it. What does this imaginary lobby have on all politicians around the world that preventing them from seeing what is right from wrong? Like if I see a human being in need, the last thing that I will ask myself is what religion or what ethnicity that person is. The first line of action is to help that person and then deal with the, po the, the politics on the side. So, yes, all what I want to say is we are living in a very strange... Well, I'll tell you um, what, Shadi, especially... Uh, thank you for that call. Great call and great point. But especially, Shadi, uh, when most of the people who support Israel regard themselves as Christians. It's as if they have never heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. My own children were playing it in, uh, in their uh, school Easter play just a week or so ago. The, the Good Samaritan is, is a fundamental part of the Christian uh, credo that you cannot pass by on the other side of the road and pretend you just didn't see or see and just don't care the suffering of the battered, the bruised, the maimed, the mutilated and the dead. It's simply an anti-Christian thing to do. But you'd be amazed how many Christians, even Christian clerics, seem able to do so with ease and aplomb. Thanks, Shadi. Vicky says, to see George where he is today, and 10,000 in the chat when establishment thought they'd beaten him, is just awesome. Thank you, Vicky. God bless you. Uh, Nicola says, hi, I'm from Serbia. Today is 25 years from the NATO bombing in 1999. I just wanted to say, if you uh, have not mentioned it, I didn't watch from the beginning. I intended to close on it, Nicola, uh, but uh, as you uh, bring it up now, it's appropriate to say uh, it's a quarter of a century uh, since the NATO barbarians savagely attacked for 76 days the people of the capital of a European country and set it on fire, set their people on fire even set Chinese diplomats in the Chinese embassy in Belgrade on fire. Night after night after night, they are mercilessly bombed. If you go to Belgrade, as I often do, a city I love and know intimately, you will see the ruins which have been carefully preserved of the great crimes of NATO 25 years ago. It tells you what NATO really is. NATO is not about fighting defensive wars in the North Atlantic. It's not even about fighting defensive wars across the globe. NATO is an offensive, war-mongering, self-perpetuating, grotesquely expensive, utterly bloated, useless, bureaucracy, machinery, it's an excrescence on the landscape. And my party, the Workers' Party of Britain, has as its number one program, point, number one in our 10-point program, is that Britain should withdraw from NATO and we should oppose all NATO and imperialist wars. Last call before the break. It's in California. It's from Tyrone. And it's on Israel. Go ahead, Tyrone.
Tyrone, are you there? Last call to Tyrone in California. Is the U.S. guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? 41,820 people have voted. And you've still got about 40 minutes to get your vote in. Coming up after the break, we've got our very own Texas Rose from the United States of America, the wonderful Rachel Blevins, and after her, the one and only Scott Ritter. Don't leave this show. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows. As I say, how lucky we are to have the audience that we do. A million people every week watching all or part of the mother of all talk shows and most attentive to what they hear and many of them truly brilliant students. It's quite humbling, actually. Oh, George, uh, blessings upon your cranium. It's, yes, it's the metamorphosis, man, or me the more for this, the intimations of in immortality experiences. <laughs> George, you, you, I like what you said. I, I love a lot of things you're saying. You know, your, your daily communion I, 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 with God is through your conscience. I, I wanted to comment on that. That's beautifully said. Your Socratic method on the on-air university is very beneficial, and I can only speak personally. Um, I uh, have appreciated because I had called last time in regard to the general strike, and you helped to really refine my understanding of that from a different point. The alternative point of view. When I heard that last week, and again today, I had this kind of visceral gut reaction to it. And I know what you're what you mean by that. And you know, the Moats audience knows what they mean by that because we're all informed citizens. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. For the the masses who don't necessarily follow uh, geopolitics, let's say, they're gonna listen to whatever the mainstream media tells them. And for them, anything that's alternative the automatic kind of reaction is, oh, okay, it's a crackpot view, it's a conspiracy theory, it's an extreme view, when really it's not. It's, let's call it what it is, it's fact-based commentary. Hello, George, nice to talk to you. By the way, you deserve every penny you get, because you're the only person who speaks the truth over all the fake news. Well, I wanted to personally thank you for um, bringing such great guests that speak about the situation. Also, I have become uh, more aware of, of people like Black Max Blumenthal um, at the Gray Zone and others who, who do update us with the correct information about Syria. And um, this has just uh, been such a great eye-opener. So thank you. You are the people who have stuck with this show and transformed it into a truly global university where it can be said that every month at least four million people will watch this show. They're in Greece, they're in Canada, they're in America, they're in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, they're in New Zealand, they're in Australia, they're in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they're in Finland. They're all over the world. They're in Africa with a call from Nigeria. This is a truly global phenomenon, and that is down to you. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. It's almost a record poll, 43,849 with, well, 45 minutes still to go. Is the U.S. guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? Yes or no? Get voting, please. I want to break the record this evening. Now, those who've been following the mother of all talk shows are throughout its latest incarnation here on screen as opposed to just on radio, will already know my respect, admiration, and affection for our next guest, our very own Texas Rose, 
back in the USA. It's the one and only Rachel Blevins. Rachel, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. You are a popular guest and much missed. Lovely to see you again. I'm just wondering what the attitude of the United States is to the terrorist atrocity visited on the people of Moscow, that great city uh, where both you and I uh, were uh, and have been uh, often visitors and you working there for a time must have been particularly painful for you to watch what unfolded at the Crocus Theatre. Yeah, well, thank you for having me back on, George. Always happy to be here. And you're right, watching the terrorist attack that unfolded just a couple of days ago in Moscow was, it was incredibly hard to see the images and the videos that were out there. And at the same time, when it comes to the pure evil that was carried out, I'm glad that we were able to see it firsthand. I'm glad that we were able to see just what was done and that there was nothing hidden there. There was nothing that was censored because the world needs to know know that this is the attack that was carried out, that this is, you know, targeting dozens of Russians, that there were thousands there who were at stake. And even when it comes to the latest, what we're hearing on the perpetrators, what Russia has said so far, what is being circulated on social media, one of the most notable things, one of the most notable responses came from the White House, and that was National Security Council spokesman John Kirby. Before the bodies were even cold yet, before we even knew how many people were dead, he was standing there at a press conference. He said, oh, well, we know it's not Ukraine. We have no indication that Ukraine was involved. And it makes you wonder for any country, but especially for the United States, knowing how much control and involvement the Biden administration has with Ukraine and with the Kiev regime, why were they so quick to immediately come out and say, oh, well, we know it wasn't Ukraine. And then shortly after that, you have these reports that ISIS has now taken responsibility for this. And if there's anything we've learned about the United States and its proxies and who it has control over. We know that it has a number of ties to not just Kiev directly, but it also has those ties to ISIS. So it was almost too convenient of a plot to come out and to have everything line up just like that. Now, obviously, there's still a lot that we don't know. There's still a lot that is being investigated. But when it comes to the response here in the U.S., I think that many Americans were shocked to see this unfold in Moscow. There's some of those who are going to be anti-Russian who are going to say, yeah, it's about time that we see attacks like this in Russia, but it's also important to remember that we had Miss Victoria Newland, who, although she's resigning, is still uh, speaking out and still very anti-Russian herself. And she was warning that there was going to be some sort of what she called surprises coming to Russia. And this horrific, heinous attack targeting only civilians with no military aims seems like exactly what Victoria Newland would have been forecasting if only she had known. Well, uh, there's been remarkably little public uh, state uh, sympathy expressed to the uh, Russian people uh, who suffered this mass terrorist outrage. The only building done up in the Russian colors in commemoration, in solidarity, uh, was the Burj in, in Dubai. It's the only one I saw in the colors of Russia. Uh, only in Belgrade did I see any mass outpouring uh, of, uh, amongst football fans uh, of uh, sympathy. Um, if this had been an attack, God forbid, on people in London or people in Paris or people in New York, the attitude would have been very different. And it's uh, yet more uh, evidence, as if we needed much more, uh, that the attitude to terrorism on the part of Western countries is very much dependent on whose terrorists they were and whose victims they were. Isn't that true? Oh, I would agree. Absolutely. I mean, where is Berlin? Where is New York with all of their light shows that you typically see when there is a horrific tragedy like the one that was carried out in Moscow? And I think it just goes to show that over the last several years, but over the last two years especially, you have seen this increase in Russophobia here in the West where 
people have been taught, not just that Vladimir Putin is bad and he's some kind of evil villain that we need to get rid of, but they have been taught to hate the Russian people, to believe that they are not worthy of the same sympathy, sympathy that anyone in the West would have been worthy of if a tragedy like that was carried out here. And I think here in the US, we need to be asking ourselves, why are we still not just supporting Ukraine, but why are we still supporting this ongoing proxy war against Russia? Do we really want to see World War III with not just a nuclear armed superpower, but with notably Russia and their arsenal? Is that the end game that we want here? Because for the last two years now, the Biden administration has done everything in its power to target Russia without directly going to war, right? They've armed Ukraine to the teeth. They've sent them plenty of funding. But at the same time, they have also carried out this sanctions war against Russia. They've made them the most sanctioned nation in the world. And they've done everything they can through the mainstream media, through the speeches that we've heard from the Biden administration to convince the American people that Russia is bad and that these are the people that we need to be targeting. But two years down the road, who's hurting from this? Well, the Americans are hurting in some ways. Our supposed allies over in the EU and the UK, they are the people who are hurting. And the Russians are continuing to become stronger on their end. They're continuing to fortify their economy and to strengthen their alliances with other countries. And so the American people need to be coming to this point of asking, why were we dragged into this campaign to begin with? Because it's certainly not benefiting us and it's not hurting the people that we were supposed to be targeting, and then they need to be asking themselves why they were supposed to be targeting those people in the first place. Now, uh, President Biden declined to call President Putin to offer his sympathies uh, on this uh, terrorist atrocity, uh, which shows you how, how low uh, the White House has sunk. Uh, what about the next president, Donald Trump? Has he had anything to say about it? Yeah, you know, we haven't heard too much from Donald Trump. I mean, when it comes to what he has said about Russia and about Ukraine specifically, he, he still is at this point of acting like he is going to come in and to fix everything in a matter of 24 hours, which we all know is simply not the case. But he obviously is going to do everything to present himself as the opposite of Biden, even though we know that when it comes to Trump and Biden, they have a number of policies that are the same, not just when it comes to past support for Ukraine and past tensions and current tensions with Russia, but also when it comes to their support, the both of them, for the ongoing genocide that Israel is committing in Gaza. And so I think when it comes down to it, you know, we look at the options that the American people are supposed to have when they're getting ready to vote in a presidential election come November, and we realize that they have much more in common on foreign policy than they actually do when it comes to the differences. And so it's it's surprising to me that Trump isn't doing more to try to cast himself as the anti-Biden all around, but I think because he has that established track record of four years already in office, and people kind of know what to expect from him, and they know that if and when he comes back into office for a second term, that he is likely to be in a position where he may not provide as much support for Ukraine, but he still is going to continue those tensions with Russia. Now, uh, the, the United States uh, is now in the electoral cycle, uh, Biden now seems certain to be the Democratic candidate, Trump to be certain to be the Republican candidate. Are the polls moving a bit or is Donald Trump still well ahead? You know, it depends on which poll you look at. It seems like in a lot of cases they're neck and neck and the headlines have been all over the place. The most key place where Trump is leading, though, are in these key swing states, right? We have just a, a handful of states here in the U.S. that are known as swing states, which essentially decide the election at the end of the day. You can assume that states like California and Texas are going to go for the Democrats and the Republicans, respectively. But when it comes down to 
what we've seen there. I think a lot of it is going to depend on whether or not Americans are actually feeling energized and they want to go out and vote, right? Do they think that anything meaningful is going to change? A lot of that revolves around the economy. Of course, that's always going to be a major issue in any election. So they may look at Trump and say, hey, the four years that he was in office, the economy was better. I wasn't struggling to pay bills as much as I am now with the four years that Joe Biden has been in office. Of course, the question then becomes, what what can Trump do if he gets in office and uh, really is targeting the economy. But when it comes to foreign policy in the past, we haven't really seen that as a major issue. But I think right now, when you're looking at the fact that we are in a situation where the suffering in Gaza is just unimaginable right now, and the U.S. is making that possible, they are enabling genocide and they should be held accountable for it. They look at people like Trump and Biden and they say, wait a second, they're very similar here. And they also look at other people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and they go, oh, wait a second, they're similar as well. So there is very much a void here in the U.S. and need for a candidate to step up who is truly anti-war, not just when it comes to questioning the support that we're sending to Ukraine, but also when it comes to standing up to Israel, standing up to the U.S. support that they give Israel and forcing a ceasefire in Gaza, forcing the aid to be allowed in, because that is something that they desperately need right now. Now, lastly, you know Moscow as I do. Uh, what do you think the impact on Russian public opinion, this outrage in Moscow, is likely to have? Is it likely to bring the Russians closer together or begin to uh, shatter their uh, national unity? You know, it, it was interesting that the U.S. put out that statement that they did back on March 7th, the head of the presidential elections, calling for Americans to steer clear of any public gatherings. And that was, of course, over the time of the election. That's what they claimed that they were talking about. But when you look at what actually happened, whether the U.S. had any forewarning of that, and you look at the outpouring of support coming from the Russian people, I know that they had hundreds of people, it was reported, that were going to blood banks immediately saying, hey, I am here to donate. What can I give? You also had people that lived around the Crocus City Hall who saw police officers and rescue workers workers out there and they were bringing them tea and coffee and food and everything that they could to help out. And so I think at the end of the day, this is more than likely to bring people together, just as everything else that has targeted Russia, that has led to the killing of Russians, it has continued to make the country stronger. And so I think that that's what we're likely to see here. I mean, we are seeing a very strong response from President Putin, from the Russian government in targeting these perpetrators, not just finding them, but bringing them to justice, getting as many of the answers out of them as they can. And so I think that the Russian people are likely to see this and to realize that their government takes it seriously and that they do not want to see the mass killing of Russians happen again. Rachel, as always, brilliant. Thank you for joining us again on the mother of all talk shows. It's a very busy show tonight 44,000 people have already voted you've still got uh, more than half an hour uh, still to vote let's make this a world record mother of all talk shows poll shall we uh, coming up after the break it is former marine corps intelligence officer former united nations weapons inspector in iraq a man who's forgotten more about war and the politics of war than most of the ministers of defense in Western countries put together. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare 
leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. Okay, 44,106 of you have voted. Get your vote in in the next 22 minutes. Let's go to the legend, our professor in Florida. It's Simon in Florida, USA. Simon, welcome back. There's no show without punch. There's no moats without Simon in Florida. Well, that's very kind of you to say, Mr. Galloway, but I do try to give some opportunity for other excellent callers to present their opinions, so I hope I'm not being uh, too present. No, we need you. Not... We need you. Don't stop calling. Very good. That's very kind of you. I'm obviously certainly not omnipresent, shall we say that at least. So um, the reason for my mm. call, um, that whilst you had already pointed out the anniversary of the NATO attack on Serbia, is to remind people that that was the first iteration of the suggestion that was put forward very strongly by uh, Tony Blair, that the Genocide Convention had a responsibility to protect, often abbreviated to R2P. And so I think that's something that's very important for people to remember as we are observing the uh, Mm. daily atrocities in Gaza, and one might ask themselves, well, where are all the other countries, not least of which the Arab nations, who should be exercising their responsibility, not an opportunity, a responsibility to protect? Talking of anniversaries, of course, this is also the anniversary of the um, armed military coup against the elected Argentinian government that led, um, unfortunately, then to the conflict over the Falkland Islands as that Argentinian government found that they weren't able to manage the economy. Some might see parallels with the situation now, particularly given the nature of the vice president of Argentina and her father's associations with some of those generals who are involved in those activities which many people may have forgotten if they're under the age of 60, might not have known in the first place, resulted in the disappearance of many, many thousands of students, socialists and other protesters against military rule. But looking forward rather than backward, and in this case, less than 24 hours forward, people should be aware that the United Nations Security Council will be attempting yet again to vote on a ceasefire resolution. Now, there is a true juxtaposition occurring because whilst the Americans had managed to delay the negotiations on their draft for a full month, seven versions, 41 paragraphs, who thousand and thirty six words as the excellent lady ambassador from Guyana pointed out not criticizing the aggressor once and indeed only putting the name Israel in those two thousand words once in a non-condemnatory phrase but instead the E10 as it is known for the elected members of the UN Security Council put forward a version disputes over the language, took it down to E7, now E8, plus China and Russia seems to be enough votes to get it through. But the question of the day, whilst it seems that Britain and France undoubtedly will only abstain and won't block what is now a one-page, bare-bones, super-simple stop-the-killing plea, is whether or not the United States, having lost their attempt to blame Russia and China because of the intervention of Algeria on Friday, explaining that they were voting no on behalf of the entire Islamic world because the American draft, whilst pretending to call for a ceasefire, 
actually mentioned future military operations. We're now going to see whether or not the Americans will reveal their true face once again and veto even a one-page simple call, just stop the killing. That's a fantastic review uh, of history and of what's going to happen tomorrow. Simon, let me, uh, we'll discuss it again, of course, on Wednesday, but let me ask you this. What happens if the Security Council passes this resolution and Israel tells them to go and take a running jump to stick it where the sun don't shine, which I could certainly anticipate might be their reaction? What happens then? Well, the timing, as is so often the case, is critical because um, Defense Minister Gallant from Israel is arriving in America today. Now, he was warned before departing by the American Defense Secretary to be ready for a very, very changed political atmosphere in America. And so even though he allegedly is bringing with him an enormous shopping list of weapons that the Israelis want to be dispatched immediately. It was interesting when she arrived in Puerto Rico that the American vice president also was calling quite categorically, not with any kind of um, conditions that she had previously expressed for a ceasefire to occur in Gaza. But we've had very strong statements out from an American citizen himself, who, as is often the case, has made Aliyah and is now the Israeli cabinet member for strategic affairs, Mr. Ron Derma. He has announced exactly what you have just suggested, that they will tell America to take a running jump if necessary. But, but the big proviso is that Speaker Johnson of the American House of Representatives, who's now clinging to his job by his fingernails, a motion to vacate having been submitted by the Congress lady from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, just before the close of business on Friday. It now seems that he is going to rely upon Democrat votes keep his job dependent upon him presenting for a vote the money and the bill for Ukraine, Taiwan and Israel. So will public opinion shift even more over the next two weeks or will they still get their ill-gotten gains because he is so desperate to remain in power? What a stinking bazaar the whole of our politics has become. Simon, in Florida, as always, a big thanks for your wisdom, your grasp. And now, it is the one and only Scott Ritter, the maestro, the master of all he service on the military political level. Back after too long, Scott Ritter, uh, wonderful to see you again. Naturally, I want to concentrate on what happened in Moscow and who did what and what will happen next. But if we uh, do have a moment uh, towards the end, I would like to ask you about tomorrow's uh, Security Council uh, vote and the new resolution uh, that has been uh, tabled. But start with Moscow, if you will. Uh, that it was mass murder most foul, uh, most people, not all, alas, uh, could agree uh, the murdering and maiming of hundreds of people, unarmed civilian people, young and old, men and women, in a concert hall would ordinarily bring down uh, the righteous indignation and wrath of all right-thinking people. Uh, but as always, it depends who the victims were and who the perpetrators might have been so far as some people are concerned. Who did it, do you think? What happens next? Right now, the evidence does point to a um, the involvement of Ukrainian intelligence. There's very strong evidence to uh, to back up that uh, that assertion. The, the Russians um, 
you know, have, from what I understand, the Russians were tracking this vehicle from the moment it left Moscow. They could have they could have stopped it at Moscow, but they let it go uh, because they were also tracking the cell phones. And they were monitoring these cell phones as they made repeated phone calls into Ukraine, where they were connected with uh, entities on the Ukrainian side of the border who uh, were arranging to have a, um, a safe passage through uh, the the Russian-Ukrainian border. Um, and that, that just directly implicates the Ukrainian government because you need the complicity of the uh, Ukrainian border services and um, and that they would have to coordinate with higher authorities. And we also know that there's connectivity between the so-called International Legion of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, particularly the, the part of the Legion that's controlled by Ukrainian intelligence, uh, and the Central Asian Republics. And that connectivity is also linked to the ongoing efforts by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency to use the Central Asian Republican uh, republics as a, um, a, you know, a, a, as a means of um, putting pressure on Russia. Also, to use the immigrants, uh, there's a large number of immigrants who work in Russia as a um, as a sea of fish amongst which intelligence operatives can swim. We did the same thing in Baghdad in the 1990s using the Kurdish population there um, as a sea amongst which the CIA, the MI6, and the Israeli Mossad uh, fish could swim. And the same thing's happening in Russia today where these immigrant populations are being used by the by foreign intelligence uh, to find disaffected persons uh, who will co- provide transportation support, who will provide uh, logistics support, who will provide <clears throat> housing support, et cetera. So it appears that the CIA, at a minimum, provided infrastructure support to the Ukrainian intelligence. But we also should never forget that the CIA, since 2022, uh, through their Special Activities Center, which is mandated by an act of Congress, by the way, to carry out covert, deniable covert operations, um, including unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare. Um, these would also be called acts of terrorism, uh, given what they do to disrupt uh, civilian life for political purposes. Uh, and the CIA, uh, the Special Activity Center, has been doing this work in Ukraine since 2022. And there's no reason to believe that um, suddenly they would have stopped doing this. We know that they have coordinated with the Ukrainian intelligence to penetrate Russian soil for the purpose of carrying out espionage, sabotage, uh, direct action attacks. Um, and again, the, what, what transpired here was a act of, you know, it was politicized direct action designed to undermine the authority of the Russian government, to undermine the authority of Vladimir Putin. This was not an ISIS attack. Um, First of all, the way it came out, it came out through a press service. Uh, ISIS normally releases uh, reports about attacks that it was directly involved in through their central um, branch. But this was done through the press service, which means that it's after the fact that ISIS is saying these people were motivated by ISIS, so we're going to take credit for it. But if you take a look at the photographs that they use, uh, when was the last time you saw ISIS martyrs blur their face? They don't blur their face because they don't care because they're dead. These guys blurred their face because they were hoping to escape. When was the last time you had an ISIS attack say, we're going to carry out this attack and then we're going to try and get away, that we're doing it for money, not for a desire to become a martyr? ISIS was a deliberate cover story crafted by Ukrainian intelligence to mislead. And I believe the United States is involved because the first thing the United States did before anybody knew anything is said, ISIS did this. You know, they, they, they didn't give any... Ukraine had nothing to do with this, they said. And as Maria Zakharova has pointed out, uh, how do you know this? I mean, you haven't even solved the Kennedy murders yet, and you're coming out and saying, you know who was responsible for the Crocus attack. Um, I'll, I'll just make it as clear as I can. This was a Ukrainian intelligence operation that I believe was aided and bedded by the Central Intelligence Agency because the United States is at war with Russia. And I want to repeat that one more time so people understand the gravity of what I'm saying. The United States is at war with Russia. It's a covert war. It's a deniable war, but it's a war nonetheless, and Russia's on to this. And if you're going to go to sleep tonight resting easy, don't. You need to be scared to death about what's to come because no nation will take an attack like this on their territory 
um, lying down. And when the Russians find out, as they will, to the, the extent to which Ukraine was involved, they already have the evidence, and to which Ukraine was assisted by the United States and, may I say, your secret intelligence service, there will be hell to pay. Um, we're talking about the potential of global thermonuclear war, because that's where this leads. That's where this leads. That's where war with Russia leads. And if you're not scared to death, then there's something wrong with you. There were a number of reasons to uh, immediately doubt the ISIS cover story. Um, the uh, first being just how immediately uh, the ISIS cover story was circulated and from whence it was uh, circulated. As uh, Zakharova said, you don't even know who killed the Kennedys in the 1960s, but you know who carried out and who didn't carry out a mass terror attack within hours in Moscow. Uh, so the speed with which ISIS were uh, supposedly uh, taking credit or being blamed uh, was the first reason to suspect it. The sight of someone uh, taking the Shahada with his left hand, his dirty hand, uh, was of course a second reason to doubt that these fellows were Muslims at all. The uh, third reason was that, as you put it, uh, they did not intend to die. And ISIS operators do intend to die. That's the purpose uh, for which they're doing it, to get to heaven uh, and uh, all the rest. The fourth reason uh, was that they were headed for the Ukraine uh, when they were eventually uh, stopped in their tracks. So like you, I discount the ISIS theory so anxiously and immediately promote it uh, by Western media outlets and Western uh, politicians. That leaves uh, who? That leaves uh, what answer to the ancient question, qui bono? Uh, what, what, who else does it leave except Ukraine, the United States, and God forbid the United uh, Kingdom? But why did they do it, Scott, if it were them? I mean, we need to get more. First of all, I think we need to just take one step back and say that the Russians are doing an investigation that's ongoing, and uh, many of these questions will be answered. I, I've seen uh, some of the interrogation videotapes, and I, I will go on record here as saying that uh, I condemn the CIA for the torture that we used against uh, al-Qaeda suspects, and I condemn Russia for the torture that they're using uh, to interrogate their people. It's Russia's business. I'm not a Russian citizen. Only the Russian citizens can hold the Russian government accountable. But as a former intelligence officer, I would tell you that's not the ideal way to interrogate. But Russia operates from a different book. If this was uh, Americans doing this, I would condemn them wholeheartedly because Americans shouldn't torture, and uh, I would never condone it. And I can't condone Russia doing it as well. So I just want to go on record as saying that, that I don't uh, condone uh, sure. the use of torture to, to, uh, sure. to, to gain I, information. I'm with you on that 100%. And one of the reasons is that you can't trust it. But um, the Russians have their own methods, and uh, I'm familiar with one of the methods they use, which is to ask a question, get an answer, and then immediately confront the uh, the person answering with the lie, that they just told a lie. And uh, you see that the, the, these people didn't know that the Russians had their cell phones, and they were being asked questions, and then the Russians asked a counter question, and they pretended they didn't know the Russians showed them the cell phone, and suddenly their memory is jarred because that was a phone call they just had moments before their arrest. Um, the Russians know exactly what's going on. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with the conclusions that Russia has drawn. And um, I don't know if this was an attack designed to take place pre-election, meaning to disrupt uh, the election. To uh, it, it would have been better for the Ukrainians had this happened pre-election because it would have uh, created in their minds the opportunity for people to question Putin's leadership, et cetera. So I don't know if this was an attack that was uh, planned to happen before the election, but because of operational issues took place after, because at some point in time when you're doing a deniable operation of this nature, um, you you let them into the wild and then they're on their own. They, 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 they may adhere to a timetable, they may not. They, you know, they will do the action when they can. 
um, or this could have been something that was deliberately planned to take place after the election uh, to, again, try to undermine Vladimir Putin. Um, but the Ukrainians right now are in desperate straits, extraordinarily desperate straits. They've always, they and the United States and Great Britain have always banked not on a Ukrainian victory, but on this war dragging out so long that it creates economic problems for Russia and domestic political problems for Vladimir Putin that could lead to a Moscow Maidan moment. That's the ultimate objective of everything the CIA and the British are doing. And when you are confronted with a collapsing situation on the front lines and an America that can't get its act together when it comes to whether we're going to provide support or not for the Ukrainians, um, sometimes intelligence services will seek to, you know, push the envelope, so to speak. Um, there is also a possibility that the CIA and the British trained the Ukrainians in the art of covert direct action, unconventional warfare but did not have a hand in this operation, meaning that this is some sort of a rogue Ukrainian operation, because we, we have word that the United States has told the Ukrainians to back off, for instance, the strategic campaign against uh, attacking Russian um, you know, oil production centers and, uh, and, and oil storage facilities. So the United States is not looking for an escalation. The Ukrainians are looking for an escalation. The only way Ukraine survives is to create a situation that NATO is compelled to intervene. I'll say it one more time. The only way that Ukraine survives is to create a situation that compels NATO to intervene, and that's what the Ukrainians are trying to do. They will continue to provoke the Russians over and over and over again in an effort to get a Russian overreaction and, therefore, some sort of NATO intervention. That's the goal. That's the qui bono. That's why this is all about Ukraine, and not about anybody else. Uh, the signs are that uh, a, a big reaction, whether an overreaction, depends on your point of view. A big reaction is in the air on its way right now. Uh, the largest uh, bombing raids of the war appear to be uh, underway. Will they be common or garden bomb attacks on industrial plant and transport infrastructure and so on? Or might the political leadership of Ukraine, uh, hitherto not attacked as a matter of deliberate policy by Russia, will they now themselves be in the firing line? I think that it's inevitable that at some point in time, the Ukrainian leadership will be in the firing line. I mean, it's hard to tell the Russians are the ones responsible for targeting, not Scott Ritter. Um, I, I happen to think that tonight we might see a continuation of the campaign to destroy the critical infrastructure of Ukraine, that the gloves have come off and the lights are going out forever. And also, uh, you might see more attacks on, for instance, buried uh, natural gas storage um, to destroy, literally just take down Ukraine's economy. Um, and with it, you, the sustainability of Ukrainian society. Uh, I, I think that before Russia would go over to the um, to the direct targeting of Ukrainian leadership targets, which, by the way, according to multiple sources, Russia has said they won't do, uh, that it's a special military operation, that they won't take that step. But if Ukraine is linked to this attack, as it appears it will be, um, then I think the gloves come off and um, Zelensky and the Ukrainian leadership are targets and they will die. I just don't know if that's going to be tonight. I think that might require uh, some, because the Russians are very legally minded, it would require some sort of formal transition away from the special military operation into a state of war. And so I think there would have to be some sort of dip, you know, a political uh, play in Russia where Vladimir Putin goes to the Duma, goes to the federal uh, assembly, um, reports to them, gets their permission, then he'll make a declaration, and then Zelensky will die. But again, I'm not a Russian. Uh, that's just my assessment. Finally, Scott, uh, the, uh, the situation in the UN is going to be uh, highly charged tomorrow. A resolution, bare bones, no frills, please stop firing now in Gaza. Can the U.S. in an election year, after all that's happened, 
really veto that? I don't think that's the question of the U.S. vetoing it, because the U.S. put forward a resolution that the Russians and the Chinese vetoed last week, um, because it wasn't a real resolution. It was a fake resolution. The key here is uh, having allowed this veto go to go to the vote, if the United States was involved in the massaging of this language, then and the Russians and the Chinese were involved in that this bare bones language um, is acceptable, I think this resolution will pass. Uh, it has to pass. There, uh, Biden has no choice but to let it pass because he's suffering more harm uh, by what's going on in Gaza than he would be by holding Israel to account. Um, the American people are disgusted with what's happening, uh, by and large. And um, the other thing is, this is becoming a test of um, America's viability as a world leader. Are we really a nation that um, has a collar around our neck attached to a leash that's held by the hands of people in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? Uh, because if we allow Israel to continue dictating to us outcomes that are critical to our national security, uh, we are suffering, we being the United States, and I would say Europe by extension, we are suffering so much damage globally in a world that we're going to have to work with when this is done. We're talking about a transition from a, you know, a singularity of American hegemony to a multipolarity, and everybody, including the Americans, recognizes the inevitability of this transition and the importance of having the United States and Europe in a leadership role. We are losing all credibility around the world because of what Israel is doing in Gaza and our collective unwillingness to hold it to check. So we have no choice but to support this. Now, the real question will be, what happens when Israel says, stick it in your ear? Joe Biden has already said that he will put holding back the supply of weapons on the table. I'd like to see him do that. This becomes a, 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 an important test of uh, Biden's leadership. And again, this is the kind of test that if you fail, you lose elections. And normally, you know, issues of, um, you know, foreign policy don't, you know, factor the largest in the American mindset when it comes to an election. James Carville famously said, it's the economy, stupid, back in 1992, to remind Clinton where to put his priority. But in this case right now, given the connectivity between Israel and the American Jewish, American Zionist population, this is a domestic political issue for the United States, and Joe Biden is going to have to stand up and be counted. This is a real test for him, and if he fails it, he lost the election. Scott Ritter, always a, a pleasure, a privilege indeed. Thank you very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. 46,449 people have voted. Probably closed now, maybe a couple of more minutes. Didn't quite make the record, but still an almighty poll. 46,449 is the U.S. guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? Well, on Telegram, 99% said yes. On Twitter, 84% said yes. On the YouTube community poll, 91% said yes. And on the YouTube stream, 95% said yes. Now, reacting to the Moscow attacks, Ab Abdul is in Ghana on Moscow. Go ahead, Abdul. Hi, George. Good evening to you, and thank you for taking my call. Now, um, welcome, sir. The Go West ahead. Has, the West has condemned this uh, Friday attack on Moscow, albeit hypocritical. What I notice is that, um, as everyone has seen, the terrorists were fleeing back to a particular country rather than the other countries neighboring Russia. Now, the question is. Mm -hmm. And what I haven't heard is, has Russia got the right to defend itself like we had after October 7? <laughs> I want you to comment on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, I, I get it. Uh, first of all, uh, very happy to hear from uh, Ghana, the land of Kwame Nkrumah, uh, and where our podcast this week is the number one podcast in your country of uh, Ghana. So very glad to hear from you. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, merely to ask that question 
is to answer it. Uh, no one will accept that Russia has the right to self-defense in the way that they hypocritically claimed Israel had that right. Abdul, thank you uh, for that call. I talked about the podcast. Uh, we are in the top five in Uganda, and we're number two in Nigeria this week. My goodness. You can download our show as a podcast right after the show by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. Let's go to Florida. We've been there already. Why not make a return visit? Heath is in Florida on Princess Kate's video. Go ahead, Heath. Uh, thank you, George. Great show as always. Um, so let me just articulate my, my thoughts here. This is going to sound a little bit fantastical, but um, there's two or three things that I think make this um, make this video very suspect. A couple of them are already doing the rounds on Twitter. Um, the first, of course, is that the background is an image. It's not a real background. If you uh, speed up the if you speed up the video, the background doesn't move, which denotes that it has to either be in a green screen, a studio, or it's CGI. The second, which I heard somebody say, which I never thought of, of course, is where's William? You know, why aren't you sitting there next to your wife when she's, when she's doing this in her time of need? Um, and then, of course, the third, before I get to the one that I've personally noticed, is that um, I've seen the video of the outfit that she wore and the exact, uh, the exact same hairstyle that she had several years ago when promoting a fitness video. It's all over Twitter, which, uh, which denotes what was probably fed into an AI generator. But then I... I blew up the image myself and I looked for anomalies. I'm in, of course, I'm in this industry. So, you know, I'm able to look for some of uh, these things. And I wanted, um, I wanted to implore anybody to just blow up the image and watch at the top of her left shoulder, the outline of her shoulder while she's speaking. Every time she starts a new sentence, the, um, the, the whole frame glitches very noticeably, which to me is just denotes that it's, uh, it's, it's actually not just AI, it's poorly rendered. Uh, that's a problem with rendering when you have a when you have an AI uh, generated um, video. So the thing that I wanted to maybe ask you to comment on is not whether or not you believe it, but if if she's not able to make the video herself, let's assume that this is the case, then it's either that she's unwilling or she's unable to. And if she's unable to, and they're doing this, then I just think the ramifications are terrifying. And I just wondered what what you had uh, to comment on that. Thank you. Well, uh, you're absolutely uh, right to say that many people are querying the authenticity of this video. I have none of the skills that you have, none of the tools that you have to uh, properly evaluate that. So I have to take it at face value uh, that the poor woman is terribly ill. What could be being concealed, of course, is just how terribly ill. Uh, what could be being concealed is where she actually is and what her prognosis actually is. And I'm very concerned about her. She's practically the only member of the royal family, apart from her own children, of course, uh, that I have any real regard for and concern for, not least because I remember what happened to her mother-in-law. So this story will run and run, uh, whether the fawning sycophants of the British political class and their hireling lickspittle journalistic accomplices think this story isn't going away. Uh, now, I get the chance to go to my own good wife. It's live in Rochdale. Gayatri, what's rattling? Israel and Moscow, these are the two subjects that are rattling. On the poll, is the U.S. guilty of war crimes by continuing to arm Israel? On your Patreon, Paul McDonald says, Israeli citizens can no longer play the Holocaust card for the rest of their lives. The lifelong oppressed have indeed become the oppressor. Please, almighty God, make it stop. Thank you, George, for your invaluable courage and strength. And Paul is, of course, referring to that famous book by Paulo Freire or called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Daryl Israel says no other country in the world has caused more upset, chaos, and bloodshed around the world since the end of World War II than the USA. If they are what they claim to be a force of good, then I hear you, George. 
we have a bridge in London to sell going cheap. And Gillian Drake asked the question, what will they do when Israel is no longer a viable asset? Well, uh, they've, uh, they've, they've invested so much, uh, or as Shakespeare put it, uh, we are steeped in blood so far. Uh, it is tedious to consider whether it is bloodier to go on or to go or whether to go forward or to go back. They are steeped in blood shed by Israel so far, and they have burned uh, forevermore uh, their possibility of friendship or influence over the people of the Arab and Muslim world so completely, and that's 2 billion people on the earth, 350 millions of them in the Arab world, with all that oil, all that gas, all that water, all that land, one language, one culture, one God, who might one day decide, hey, we better get together and have some influence over the world and what happens uh, to us. One last one, Gayatri. Well, the other one, of course, on the Moscow attack, there's plenty of them coming in, but this is an interesting one, because obviously you refer to uh, Victoria Newland as one of the signs, uh, we could probably read into and this one is from brandon in spain he says george ron paul said last week that we should prepare for a black swan type event like a 9 11 attack or something of that nature was it this perhaps the one in in russia on friday seeing that russia is winning the war well it's a good point uh, a black swan event would usually involve more fatalities uh, than occurred, albeit now over 180 dead people in that theater in Moscow. But what if the Black Swan event itself uh, did not have thousands of casualties, but causes a chain of events that leads to millions, maybe tens of yes. millions of casualties? That would truly be a Black Swan event. Thanks very much, uh, Gayatri. See you after the show in four minutes time. Uh, the legend that is Erobos, Abzu Lamashtu, says we don't have a candidate here in the USA that checks all the necessary boxes. Pro working class and anti-war. We get one or the other, not both. We need better people to step up. And Ian McKillop says vote Muhammad in Ilford North, Akunji in Bethnal Green, Dent Code in Kensington, Feinstein in Holborn, Gorst in Garston, San in Liverpool, Wavertree, all independents. And last call, I think. We've got time for one more. It's in Los Angeles. It's Christian, who loves the show. Glad to hear it. Christian, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Mr. Galloway, how are you, sir? I am so blessed to be speaking with you. Thank you very much for taking my call, especially as the last call of the day. I'm honored. Um, you know, I'm. I first, I just want to start off. Being in Los Angeles, you would expect me to be a typical Democrat, but I'm not. Uh, I'm a. I'm a staunch conservative with the Palestinians, uh, and that's a very rare thing to Excellent. hear about. But there's many of us out there, unfortunately. You know, with uh, with all of the propaganda and the drum beating of war on the right, they usually get sucked into whatever party, whatever faction is the is the dominant one. In this case, being the Israelis over the Palestinians, and there is this almost cognitive dissonance that I've noticed with the Republicans, my fellow once level-headed Republicans, I should say, uh, who they they just are. are apparently ignorant or arrogant or, or, or ignorant to the fact, I should say, to uh, to Israel's uh, genocide or Israel's 75-year geno genocide, I should say. Um, as a Ron Paul supporter, which is funny, you guys just ta talked about Ron Paul and, and his mention on the Black Swan event. I was one of his delegates mm -hmm. for California's slate back in 2012. And so I got to the, go to the Republican National Convention in Florida representing Ron Paul. I met Tucker Carlson there, which is when he was first starting out uh, to, to awaken 
to this entire, you know, systemic problem that we've got going on, specifically with, you know, APAC and their control over our government. And and it, it just it saddens me, George. I'm, I'm just look, I don't want to beat the dead horse with a stick. I'm a conservative. I support the Palestinians. Uh, there's many of us out there. I've gone to the protests, you know, wearing. Yes, wearing my MAGA hat. OK, yes, wearing my MAGA hat. But, you know, my my point is, is to is to bridge the gap is to uh, to bring both the left and the right, because there's so many things that we agree with, George. And unfortunately, we've got this propaganda machine run by APAC, and we all know that, that that steers us the wrong way and makes us all look the wrong direction. Um, and I'm just so thankful that well, you got God bless you, Parliament, Christian. Thank uh, you. That was, God bless uh, you. That's a wonderful call. Thank you. God bless you. That's a wonderful call to end the show from Christian in Los Angeles. And this is the week in which Candace Owens, uh, because of her questioning of the Israeli narrative because of her increasing, steadily increasing, aggregating uh, level of consciousness about the truth, about the reality of the Palestinian tragedy and the responsible parties for it, was effectively sacked by the outfit, the wire I think it's called, that she was working for uh, and which has now kicked her out. It will turn out as Piers Morgan once told me, a sacking is a great opportunity. And it will, I'm sure, for Candace Owens, be the opportunity to move into a even higher level of popularity and interest uh, in her work uh, on her own platforms. I'm absolutely certain of that. Just as the sacking uh, of Tucker Carlson uh, kicked him into the stratosphere as the world's most successful, powerful, and presumably best paid broadcasters in the world. It will happen also to Candace Owens. But even Alec Jones of, uh, of uh, uh, infamy in the, uh, in the info war uh, uh, field uh, has uh, finally tippled, as we say, uh, to the truth. He's finally seen through uh, that uh, you can't really be America first if, in fact, truthfully, you're Israel first. You can't really be uh, for free speech if you are actually in favor of suppressing the freedom of speech of those who support Palestine, who oppose uh, Israel. And thirdly, Tucker Carlson himself, who has been uh, passive and silent, mostly, on the last uh, almost 200 days of disaster has also, like Owens, like Jones, Tucker Carlson himself has begun uh, to move much closer to a position enunciated by Christian in Florida and as enunciated for fully 50 years by me and by us here at the mother of all talk shows. I sing hallelujah. It's my duty, my job, my mission. It's my mission to win as many people as possible, whatever their previous attitude to the righteousness, the greatness, the centrality of the cause of Palestine, the cause of Gaza, which is the moral center of the world. If you fail the test, on the issue of Palestine, on the issue of Gaza, you failed a very important test indeed, on which I believe you will ultimately be judged in this life and the next. I've run out of time. I've ran over time. And I have now to drive to London. So if you'll forgive me, I'll be saying good night to you, but welcoming you offering an invitation to you to join me again on Wednesday for the midweek mother of all talk shows. I'll be back at 7 o'clock, God willing, on Wednesday. Why don't you come along and bring another viewer with you? Why don't you? Good night. <laughs>